So we're finally gonna make pineapple mead. Took four years to get here, but today we are making pineapple mead. And not the same way that I made the one that I've been tasting all along. This one's actually gonna be made with real whole pineapple chunks that we have here. They were frozen and they are now defrosted. They've been sitting in that bowl for several hours. There's some juice coming out and everything like that. So they are good to go. We're, we're ready. But beyond saying this is a pineapple mead, there's a lot more going on. And while we prepared sort of for this, we also left some things up in the air because we wanted to go through the process with you guys and explain like why we choose this and why we choose this and how we come to those decisions. Not just, well, like, oh, we chose, we're gonna go with wildflower honey for this as an example. And the reason is we had a quick, what, 30 second discussion and said, well, the orange blossom is probably a little bit strong and all the other flavored ones might get lost because the pineapples can be a fairly strong flavor. Wildflower is more neutral and it should only add a little bit of a floweriness, but it won't add to the acidity note that comes from pineapple. Boom, that's why we're going with wildflower honey. Very simple decision, but it actually had a lot of ramifications to it. So let's get started with the honey first. And I'm gonna use three pounds. We are using a little big mouth bubbler because we have a big old pile of pineapple that's gonna be going in this, as well as some other things. And I wanna have that in a bag, it's easily removable that sort of thing. Today we are using Sweet Squeeze Honey that we'll have links to in the description below. And this one's been sitting for a little while, so it might be a little thicker because it's starting to crystallize just a touch, which is no problem. Just you want to heat it up if that happens. You can see some chunkage coming out. Honey doesn't really spoil, so not really a problem. Just makes it uh, a little thicker, a little harder to work with. Three pounds, by the way. Another advantage to the little big mouth bubbler is that wide mouth. I can just pour stuff right in. I don't have to worry about filling the funnel and cleaning out the funnel and all that kind of stuff later. It's just so much easier. Now it does have a best before note on it, which I've never seen on honey before. And so does salt. And we're still within the time frame of the best yeah. before, so we're all good. All right, so we have our honey. Now the first thing I wanna do is get that mixed up a little bit. So I'm gonna take some water, fill this about halfway, and we'll start stirring that up. And if you're wondering why I'm only filling it halfway, it's for a couple of reasons. One, it's easier to stir and mix up when it's only halfway. And two, I have other stuff to go in here. I don't know how much space that's gonna take up. So I don't wanna, you know, take up all the space with water. And this is where you want to be a little bit sloppy. You don't wanna spill it all over the place, but you wanna get some air in there, okay? You want it, you want it to aerate. You should see the color lighten as you do that. And uh, what this does is it allows the yeast to use that oxygen in the very beginning phase of their colonization attempts so that they can go forth and multiply. And uh, once they've done that and use up all the oxygen, then they get to making alcohol. So the amount of yeast that you put in is a minuscule amount of the size that the colony will be once they've reproduced. Very important factor to remember. Many people still, still ask us this. They seem to believe that the amount of yeast you put in determines the amount of alcohol you make. It actually does not um, at all. You can put in a very small amount of yeast and they'll multiply out to a very large amount of yeast and create the same amount of alcohol as if you put in a lot of yeast in the beginning. So same concept. There are different factors to that and that's a whole other video. I'm not gonna get into that now. If you wanted to use one of those whip attachments on your drill, now would be the time. Go for it. I just, you know, um, I'll just do this. Entertainment value. Isn't this much more exciting than watching me use a drill? Okay, for my next trick, the next thing I'm gonna put in is actually going to be the yeast nutrient. And for this, we're using Fermato, two grams, mixed in a little bit of water, just mixing it up to totally hydrate it and break it up and let it do its thing. I'm just gonna pour that right in. Now, there's no harm in doing that because uh, it's, it's inert. It's, it's not a living thing, so it doesn't really matter. The water was a little on the warm side, like maybe body temperature warm, okay? So like in the 90s or so for Fahrenheit. And I did that on purpose to help the loosen up the honey. Mm -hmm. It helps mix it up. It also gives the yeast a touch of a head start. Um, a lot of companies suggest hydrating yeast, which we haven't bothered doing in a long time and it hasn't really made any difference. But when they do suggest hydrating it, they suggest hydrating it in a warmer liquid than you might normally ferment in. So it kind of does both things all at once. For a long time, people gave us a hard time because we didn't use bags for all of our fruits and various stuff. So now we're starting to use bags more. But not only are we using a bag, we're using a weight in our bag. So that way it keeps the bag down. We don't have to swirl it as often. You should be able to drop that in there. You don't want to drop it in there. 
Carefully place it in there. It won't hit the bottom. Okay. I was holding it up on purpose. The bag, the weight, our hands, all of the utensils that we're using have been sanitized in the red bucket of sanitization. No jazz hands? Wow. You know people are gonna give us crap about that now, That's right? That's all right. In goes the pineapple. Now this is, like I said, frozen pineapple, previously frozen pineapple. I don't know if I'd use canned. Um, there's other stuff added there, corn syrup and things like that. I don't, I don't really like that concept. So I don't know that I'd use that. If you wanna use a fresh pineapple, I would cut it into chunks, then I would freeze it anyway. Freezing does a couple of things. It kills off some of the microbes that could go, that make things go bad, but it also breaks up the cell walls and allows things to, uh, once it defrosts, just kind of, you saw all the liquid that came out of there. That's just within the fruit itself. That's the cell walls breaking apart, creating juice. To that, the most controversial meat ingredient ever, I like them, okay? Raisins, they're good for you. But they also add a little bit of a sweetness and kind of almost a smoky tanginess that without it, pineapple might be a little bit bland. Now you can basically add any dried fruit that you wish to this oh, rather sure. than raisins if you don't particularly like raisins. What you're looking for is dried fruit and you wanna make sure that those dried fruit have not been treated with oil or any preservative. Yeah, there's no sulfates in these, sulfites or sulfates actually in these. How much am I using? Probably about, oh, four tablespoons, quarter cup or so. Not, not a tremendous amount. Not enough to add a ton of flavor, but it does add just like a little backbone that would be missing if it wasn't there. Yeah. Now, I'm gonna seal up this bag. Okay, the idea is to submerge it and keep it submerged. So I wanna kinda get that top part underneath it so it'll stay. We are using a nut milk bag and it has a super fine mesh, which is really cool, but because the mesh is so fine, it does tend to collect gases and kind of let it float. So you wanna kinda of mush it down there so that way it you burst its bubble and it stays submerged. <laughs> it ain't working so well, but it's okay. If you have parts of your bag that seem to want to float, you just gotta make sure that you keep everything moist. That's all. Um, as I add more liquid, I have a feeling this will do better. So we have another decision to make, and that is tannins. We know that pineapple is gonna create more of a thin beverage if we don't do something about it. In the past, we've used a lot of tea to create tannins in our brews, and there's nothing wrong with that. It actually works really, really well. It's more or less a semi-predictable result. But I thought, you know, we've been talking a lot about adding wood to stuff lately and aging it on oak and things like that. We always say, oh, if we oak this, it would be better. Oh, if we added oak to this, it'd be even better. If we oak this, it'd be better. So why not just add some oak to it now? Maybe it won't be oak, but it'll be wood. I have this bag of wood from Ken from Barrel Char Wood Product. He, whenever he has a new thing, he sends me a sample of it and we just have, collection and he's probably laughing at me right now. He's like, I can't believe you kept all that. But what I wanna do is this is the process. This is how we figure out what to do. Let me, you know, let's just push this out of the way a little bit. And I'm just gonna, okay, we have cherry medium toast. Now this one's been used once already. I think it was used in our initial uh, our beginner tests. mead test. Yeah. Then we have French Oak Medium Plus Toast. This is an amazing one. We may end up using it. We also have Amberana, which is kind of like a cinnamony kind of thing. That's a possibility, but I don't know. Uh, let's see what else we got. French Oak Medium Plus Toast Sherry Infused. So this is like French Oak and then some. And then I have Birch Medium Toast. And we have white oak bourbon barrel char. Now, Derica asked me a question before we started. She said, what is rum generally aged in? And it's actually aged in white oak, American white oak bourbon barrels. Um, sugar maple medium toast. Now this was also used in our other one. A lot of people ask how many times you can use these. We don't really know. Once, twice, three times, I don't know. Um, this is another heavy char. Ooh, smells really good. The ones that aren't labeled, I kind of just keep for our own uh, 
Hey, let me experiment with this. But um, we're only gonna use label one. European chestnut medium toast. All right, so. This is my vote. Yeah, I figured that. They are in zip top bags though. So what I wanna do is just open it up and give a smell. Now this happens to be the uh, white oak bourbon barrel char. This is Derek's choice for this. It has a really nice smell. It's strong. It's a strong smell. So it's gonna add to the flavor component. This is the European chestnut medium toast. That smells nice too though. Yeah, I think they're all gonna smell nice, honestly. Yeah. And this is what we do. We go through and give it a smell and See, this smells a lot. This is the sugar maple. It smells a lot like the European chestnut. I remember when we did the test of the sugar maple, though, it wasn't the smell yeah. we liked better than it, the taste. Yeah, the taste of it wasn't, wasn't nearly as strong. You could probably put that one to the side. Birch. I've never actually aged with birch. Where's the birch? I don't know if I want to on this one because it's, it's, it's got a unique scent. I don't know that it really goes with this. French oak, medium plus toast, cherry infused. I would I would say that or the white oak right off the bat. Yeah, we know we like the French oak. I don't know, I'm torn now. Cherry. See now, the, these that are used smell like that mead now, so it's really difficult. Oh, French oak, medium plus toast. That's your basic French oak. And we have Amberana. The Amberana smells like French toast. Like vanilla French, French toast. It's just, it's amazing. I don't think it's right for this. I have narrowed it down to the white oak bourbon barrel the and the French, French oak. oak. And I have the others and I'll just put everything away. So here's the options. The French oak medium plus toast is going to add a mild amount of flavor, but a good amount of tannins. The white oak bourbon barrel char is gonna add tannins, but it's also gonna add a lot of flavor. So it's a judgment call which way we wanna go. Yeah, we might for this first one do the French oak. Just so I'm we thinking we can save the white oak bourbon barrel char for finishing something sure. that wants yeah. that extra flavor. For this one, stick with something a little bit more on the neutral side. Um, you might say we're playing it safe, and yeah, you're, totally you're kind of right. We're playing it safe, because we don't want to overpower that pineapple. This is just such a... They're similar, don't get me wrong. They're actually quite similar, just not as strong a flavor. It's not as charred, and it's not aged in bourbon, so it's going to have a little more of a neutral effect. So, in it goes. All right, so now it's time for more water, I think. Actually, we can add the yeast now. Want to add the yeast so I'm going to add the yeast okay. now, and then we'll we'll mix everything up later. So this is another thing we discussed about prior to filming because we had options. Yeast is one of those things you can really alter the flavors and composition of any brew with a different kind of yeast. We've been really liking the Red Star yeast lately, and they have one that used to be known as Montrachet. It's now called Premier Classique. It's about a 13 percent. Uh, alcohol tolerance, we've seen it go a little bit higher. This, I'm hoping for something around a 1.105-ish uh, gravity reading. Therefore, it comes out to around 13%. Even with the pineapple, it'll be 13, 13 and a half. Something like this is just right. It's also known for keeping fruity flavors and things like that, which is really important in this kind of brew. Pineapple, from what I've seen and what I've heard, can lose its flavor really quickly in a brew. So we don't want to overpower and we don't want to lose it. We want to do everything we can to keep it. So here we go. Red Star, listen up. <laughs> Putting it in plastic doesn't work. I can't tear it. I wanna be able to tear the package. I don't wanna to have to use my teeth. And now I have to go all the way over there around the camera and get a pair of scissors to open this up. Should not need tools to open a packet of yeast. How much am I gonna use? The whole thing, why? Why not? First, we've had very, very good luck using the entire package. By the way, what am I going to do now? Crack your packet! That's right. There's a reason to do this, and it's to get all the yeast out. I mean, there's, there's yeast stuck in there, so I 
thwack the packet a few times and they all come out and it's all, it's all good. Now, add some water. This is why we pre-mixed, because if I had honey sitting in the bottom of this, it would be very, very hard to mix this at this point. Being that this is a larger than one gallon, oh, I'm not gonna need it anymore. I just wanted to say something because people tend to get a little crazy on us about how much water we use. So I specifically oh. filled this to 128 fluid ounces, which is a gallon. A gallon. And we're down to just six, uh, eight. Eight fluid ounces. So I used ounces. 120 fluid ounces. So there's that answer. So we should end up with a gallon of product. The general answer is how much water do you need? Enough to fill it to the container you're using. That, that's pretty much what you want to do. And you know, allow for spillage, like <laughs> what I just did. Um, I do want to just mix this around a little bit before I take a reading. And yes, we are aware that it is important because it will change the dilution rate. And so your ABV, your initial gravity reading is going to be slightly different. But more than likely, it's going to be slightly different based on what type of honey you're using, because you're not going to be using the exact honey that we used, what your environment is, so many other factors. The that, calibration of your scale. Yeah. I mean, there's a million factors that can affect it. That's why we like to give an original gravity reading rather than a true volumetric measurement. Yeah, that made sense. Because that way it's more accurate. You can shoot for that gravity very easily. Like you could say, okay, if I'm making, a, I have a gallon and a half pitcher. Okay, I'm gonna use that to make my, my brew. Well, I know that they started with a 1.100. I put in the amount of honey that they said and I only got a 1.080 gravity. Okay, add more honey till it gets to 1.100. Now you have relatively the same brew we did. Whereas if you just stuck with, well, that's how much honey they used, it wouldn't be the same. Make sense? Now I know that wood's gonna float. I'm aware of that and it's something that I'm just gonna have to deal with. Like by finding it and jamming it down the side. I did not put it in the bag because I want to be able to remove that, just in case. I have a feeling... It's not going to stay. No, it's going to be a pain. <laughs> I could put a, like, a lead sinker on it and tie it down or something. But, but I have a feeling it's going to come out before the bag does. So I wanted to make sure I had that option of removing it sooner rather than later. But now, it's mixed up. Let's get a reading. Find out what that gravity is. Now this reading is going to be approximate because the pineapples have not released all their sugars, so we have to take that into consideration. Speaking of sugars in the pineapple, let me just talk about that for a minute. People are always asking, how do you calculate for that? Let me just give you an example. We use two whole pounds of frozen pineapple in here, okay? I just looked that up using Google Foo and found out that there's about 45 grams of sugar in one pound of pineapple. So that means there's 90 in two pounds. That equates to 0 0.009 gravity, nine points of gravity in the whole brew, potentially from the pineapple. Once you ferment that out, that is literally like 1%, 1 1.2 to 1.3% ABV potentially coming from the pineapple. It's not anything to get overly worried about. Now, if you add six, seven, eight pounds of fruit, well, that's a whole different thing, but you have other things to worry about, like where are you fitting honey in there? But uh, <laughs> that just gives you an idea of how we come up with those things. Pineapple is not known for having a ton of uh, sugars. Berries are another one. They don't have a lot of sugars. When you get into like um, bananas and things like that, they tend to have a lot of, a lot of sugars though. So we we'll are just grab a reading here. So our hydrometer reading on this is giving us 1.090, 0 1.090, okay. So that means 1.090 plus the nine points, 1.099, which my target was 1.100. So I'm off by one point on my target gravity. Not too bad, I'll take it. I'm pouring that back in because all of this was sanitized. It's all clean. You're, there's no issue in doing that. Many people throw that away or drink it. It's really sweet. Not sure I'd want to drink it. So we want to put our lid on. Crank it down. Very, very important with these little big mouth bubblers. Crank it down harder than you think. When you think you're done, Wait a minute and try again because it probably has another extra half a turn to go. Otherwise, it might not be down far enough to clamp the seal. 
There's a very thin layer of foam in the top of this lid, and that is what creates the seal. So you want to smoosh that by cranking it down. Yeah. Some people take like four or five of those seals together, and they make a thicker seal that way. So that, that works too. All right. So our airlock is filled with sanitization liquid at the midway mark that is indicated on our airlock. Um, a very important aspect of brewing that I don't have in front of me right now, but I'm going to make as soon as we finish this video, is note taking. What do I put on my notes? The name of the brew. The date I started it all of the ingredients. I usually leave off the yeast for whatever reason. I don't know why. So I end up watching our video again to find out what <laughs> yeast I used. And the original starting gravity. These are all really important things to have for repeatability and consistency. And that way you know when your brew is done, when it's safe, when it's ready to go, all those sorts of things. But this is now, what are we gonna do with it? We're gonna let it sit. For a few hours, a few days, whatever it takes until that starts showing some activity. If we don't see activity in the first few days, I'm gonna start looking for evidence inside the fermenter because maybe we didn't get a good enough seal, but if I see bubbles coming up the side, I know it's working and it's all good. We'll be back to show you once it's started up. All right, so here we are about 18 hours in maybe. And as you can see, we have a pretty active fermentation, a little overactive maybe. <laughs> and, uh, here we go, there's my note, it's just kind of ruined. And this is why we say to put it on a cookie sheet with a lip. That's how much leaked out. So sadly, there's a little bit of wastage here because there was too much in the fermenter and it took off a lot more than I ever thought this one would. But um, hey, it started up, the yeast are happy. We're gonna have pineapple mead, so yay. All right, so it's been 13 days and looking at the airlock, which Yes, there is probably a little bit of must mixed into that star sand or into that whiskey at this point, probably, because this thing exploded. Um, but I do want to get a reading on this. We have not checked it since we started it. We have not done anything to it. It's been sitting on a shelf. I did give it a couple of swirls the first few days, and that's about it. I don't get too into that so much anymore, mostly because of where we keep them is a little bit less convenient. It's like if you go this way, you avoid the bag. What I'm trying to do is avoid the go. bag, like she says. Um, and we are just going to take a gravity reading on this, which simply means use the sampling method of your choice. Turkey baster works just fine. Um, the syringe and tubing we seem to like. And I'm going to put that into a graduated cylinder with a hydrometer so we can just take a specific gravity reading to find out where it's at. Okay, so we started at a 1.090 and I said at about nine points. So 1.099 with the uh, fruit that we added in there. And this looks to have gone, wow, it's at 0.998. So let me write that down. So that's 0 0.998. That puts it just a little bit below 1.000. It's a pretty safe bet this is done, but you know what? We're gonna do due diligence and we're going to let this go for one more week and then take another reading. And if they're the same, then we move forward. It's also starting to clear ever so slightly, but we also have other things to add to this. So I wanna make sure it's totally done before we move forward. I'm just pouring it in very carefully. I'm actually pouring it right onto the bag that's still floating up over the top here. Also, it's a good idea at this time to take the lid off because you get to see what's going on and you get to stick your face in there and spoilers not going to tell you what we're experiencing. Yeah, I'm not going to say a word. Okay. So I'm going to put the lid back on. Crank this sucker back down. And now I want to give it a little bit of a swirl. I haven't done this in a few days. And the reason I'm doing it now is twofold. One, to get some of those fermentation gases out. Now this actually smells quite nice. You could probably tell because I do not have a poker face. But I want to get those gases out and let the yeast have a chance just in case there's anything left that they want to get at. As you can tell, the airlock is going active, so we know gases are coming out of there. The second part of this is I want to make sure that the bag, the wood that's floating in there, everything is wet. Because if it goes dry, bad things can happen. Mold. Bad, bad, bad things. So and We're not mold in fermentation. Once the fermentation process is really going, and if everything is a perfect scenario, you've got a good seal, you've got an airlock on there, everything is go, it becomes an anaerobic environment. And that means there's no more oxygen in there. And that's one of the things that mold needs to survive. So sure, things happen and you don't have the perfect environment and it can still occur, 
but more than likely, it's going to be more challenging for those molds to actually grow. It's pretty hard to mess up a brew, in all honesty. Once it gets going, it's pretty hard to mess it up. I always like to say, brews want to make themselves, we just need to get out of the way. And that is really the truth. Once we lay the groundwork and get it going, just sit back, let it do its thing. It'll be just fine. There's only a few things you need to do that can help things along, like what I'm doing right now. Remember, if you ever have a question along the way of your brewing process, please ask us in the comment section below, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. And do that before you dump your brew. Yeah, definitely. So uh, what are we gonna do with this now? We're gonna let it sit. About another week, see you then. Okay, it's time for the second reading, and we're feeling pretty hopeful, as you can tell by the fact that we have the bowl and the colander ready, along with more pineapple bits. They've been defrosting for a while. It was .998. I mean, you know, we're pretty sure it's done. Okay, when you remove the lid, the first thing you want to do is a visual inspection. Looks pretty good. Yeah, I don't see anything untoward. What I'm looking for is things floating in there, things with hair, blue, black, green, moldy looking things. Tentacles. Yeah, and I mean, if something's moving around, that's probably a really bad thing too. I'm also checking for smells. Yeah, there's no bad mm. smell in this one. <laughs> wow. How old is this? We cheated because we put the oak this in This is the 20 beginning. days old. It smells good. It really does. Wow, yeah, the, I, we, we cheated. The oak <laughs> is going to stay in this too. I'm not taking that out Really? Yet. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to take a taste. We'll do a preliminary taste. I think I want to leave the just oak for in there. But I am going to take nice. the bag out. Now remember, this has pineapple chunks and raisins. That's what's basically in the bag. I'm just going to let it drain a little bit. We all know this is my least favorite part. I'm not squeezing the bag. We do more than one video in a day, and this is like the third one that I've had to do this with. The first one, I totally squeezed the bag. The oh second one, I got halfway. This one, no, not doing it. We have a colander inside a bowl right here for this very reason. Yeah, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> now I gotta go wash my hands. Okay, so, now that we did that, let me take a reading. Oh yeah, 0.998 on the nose. It's exactly where we want it to be. So I'm just going to pour a little bit of this off. I'm going to take a little sample taste because I'm pretty sure we want to add more fruit, but does it need anything else? Who knows? Do we want to leave the oak in longer? I think we're going to like this one. So it's a larger, larger initial pour. Mm, see when you do a dedicated smell, it's a little younger smelling than it was before. Yep. It smelled much richer. Go ahead and taste. Keep in mind, this is like 13% alcohol and only like three weeks old. That's not bad. It needs more tannins though. So we're gonna leave the wood in there. Mm -hmm. It's nice and rounded, but I think it does need a little bit more. Three weeks just isn't enough sometimes. It needs more. I also want more pineapple flavor. Definitely. Without a doubt, more pineapple. So. Can you put that glass over there? I can put this glass over here. Thank you. So, a couple things we gotta do. Bing! We have this vessel hidden down here on the bench because we're going to rack this now. We know we're keeping the wood, so we're putting the wood in there. We know we're keeping that sample, so we're gonna put that sample in here. I'm just gonna pour it really carefully. Some people throw this away. I'm not some people. And to those people I say, why waste it? I mean, you could drink it, you know, but it'll be so much better in a few weeks. Why would you drink it now? For our normal racking procedure, we put our destination vessel, which is this, lower than our source vessel, which is this, and we need our auto siphon. All right, as always, with an auto siphon, you have the, this piece, and then you have the tubing. The tubing goes into the destination. This goes into the primary fermenter, whatever you want to call it, the source. I go halfway down to get it started so I don't disturb too much of the lees. And we get it going and then drop it and just walk away. We have a dedicated video to our racking process and I will link that in the description below. All right, it's racked. We got a bag. We got to wait. We got more fruit. Let's put all that together. <laughs> so I'm going to put the weight in the bag first and then I'm going to put the bag in here because this, this, yeah, it, it's frozen Juice. 
and it's got juice coming out. And we don't want juice in our table. We want it in our fermentation vessel because that this juice is, is good. This is mostly thawed. Well, okay, it's not even remotely thawed. It's still ice chunks, which if this was a fermentation, like if we were still looking to ferment this, that might not be such a good thing. But because this is done, I'm not worried about it. Now, will this restart fermentation? Maybe. It, it has a chance, except that we're very close to the tolerance of our yeast. So it might, for a little while, it might extract some sugars from this, making this a little bit sweeter. So we'll check a gravity next time around, as long as I remember, and that way we'll know if it extracted sweetness or if it actually fermented more. I need to wash my hands. Do you want to tie this up before you wash your hands? I want to wa I want to tie this up before I wash my might hands. Might get gooky. <laughs> Regooked. It's a new thing. Regooked. Regooked. That's the technical term. <laughs> Now the weight is so that this doesn't float because we want this to go to the bottom. It's probably going to stick out of the liquid a little bit. And before somebody freaks out about headspace, um, yes, there's more headspace here than we normally would like. Once I get my hand out of there, actually, it's not that bad. Never mind. Now the bag was sanitized. The weight was sanitized. Brian was sanitized. The bag has air in it too. <laughs> so he is using his sanitized hand to push that bag down and try to get those air bubbles out. So that way it'll limit any floating. And they're not coming out. All right, now I gotta go wash my hands. It's like ASMR or something. <laughs> well, so many people have given us a hard time about talking while the fermenter was open. Yeah, people have done that. And I mean, there's there's some truth to it. Okay, I'll give them that. But in reality, the likelihood of you infecting your brew by breathing or talking over it in the little bit that we do, it's really not very likely. I mean, sure, it's possible, but it's really not very likely. Um, anyway, I wanna get this dry so that I can put my note back on. And then, what are we gonna do with this? We're gonna let it sit. Since there's fruit in there, the fruit is partially frozen still, so it's gonna take like 24 hours to defrost. Um, but it'll probably go another couple of weeks because I wanna extract all that fruit. And I wanna see, will this start fermenting again? Because if it does, that's okay. It'll just have a little bit more alcohol and we'll worry about it at that point. That's kind of the way we like to brew, is I have a rough idea of what we're gonna make and we say, all right, well, we did two pounds in, in primary, and then we just put two more pounds. That's how much we used, by the way, two pounds of pineapple in conditioning. If it re-ferments, all right, well, we need to adjust sweetness even more. Will we add honey this time? We, we're not really sure. We did use Premier Classic yeast, which is a 13% yeast, and we're in that 13% range for alcohol. So maybe we're past the tolerance, and maybe it'll just extract the flavors and the sugars and make this pineapple mead more pineapple-y find out soon. And we're back with pineapple mead. Now, this has been sitting on the second round of pineapple chunks in a bag, and we noticed it actually re-fermented a little bit. There was activity, there was some foam, there's even a little bit of croissant formed. So, yeah, I waited till it pretty much was neutral in the airlock again, which I know is not the end-all be-all, but it is a good indication that something might be finished. I do, however, want to get the bag of fruit out of there, get the wood out of there. So I'm literally just going to grab them and take them out. So I did squeeze the bag just a little bit and there's gonna be a little bit more that comes out. What we do, and somebody asked us, I guess we didn't show it last time, was we did dump that back in at the end. Um, I guess it wasn't on video, but yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's very minimal comes out. So it's yeah, just a precautionary really thing. It's, it's not really necessary, I guess. You know what it smells like? It smells like pineapple. It smells like pineapple. <laughs> So what I want to do is take a reading on this and get our final gravity, which is really not a final gravity because this is going to be like a supplemental final gravity. So let's get the hydrometer and test tube and see how it goes. They might be wondering, why am I taking a reading if we already knew that it went dry? It's because I added more fruit and like I said, it actually re-fermented a little bit. So I want to make sure that it's done and 0 0.994. It's lower than it was before, which is crazy. <laughs> but let me let me take a note. So essentially, we kind of step fed this. I could add up the sugars that are in the pineapple, which we know from earlier it was about nine points, 0 .009 gravity. So that would be like 
1.2% more ABV, something like that, which is pretty cool. And I will actually put the full calculation of that eventually. Don't, don't leave, it'll, it'll come up. But uh, 0.994, you know what? Let's, um, let's take a quick taste of this. It's not super clear, but we also did just mess it all up with the bag, so I'm not gonna hold that against it. Can you hand me that fermenter, please? That's part of why we do multiple rackings and we're gonna let it sit. So it'll clear out. It was actually getting fairly clear, so that's that's pretty cool. Because this seems pretty young and full of itself, I'll do the first smell and taste. It does smell like pineapple. It smells a little sweeter than the old pineapple mead that I had. Less rich, though. Like, it doesn't have the cooked pineapple flavor mm. or smell. I would actually like to calculate out that ABV for you, though. So here's how we're gonna do that. Very, very simple. I'm gonna whip out the calculator the teachers told me I would never have within arm's reach that was sitting right here. I keep doing that joke, but I just think it's hysterical because I was told that for years. Okay, so we started with 1.090, and we now know that the sugars were about nine points. So I'm gonna add those 0.009. So that gives us a 1.099 starting gravity. That went down to 0.998, minus 0.998 gives us 0.101. Now, at the end here, I added nine points to that. So that means that 998 plus nine would have been 0 0.007, and then it went down to 994. So that's another 13 points. So plus 0 0.013 gives us 0 0.114, or 114 points of gravity were spent. And I know, half of you are going, Huh? But that's the way it works. I'll have a write-up of it and everything like that. Times 135 gives us 15.39% ABV. We use Premier Classique, which is a 13% yeast. Further proof that yeast can't read. But what we also did is this is sort of a step feed, if you really want to think about it. It was already at like a 12% or something like that. The yeast were already primed. They were still active. We gave them a little bit more sugars with a lot of nutrient because it was whole fruit let them go just a little bit further. So I'm gonna mark this as 15.4%. Pretty respectable. And yeah, you can taste the alcohol. That's the, about the only note that I'll give you right now. But there'll be a tasting. We may end up back sweetening this. I'm not sure yet. The oaking, I might wanna oak this more. I'm not sure, but not yet. For now, we're gonna let this clear out before we uh, go any further. So we're, we're just gonna stick a Oh, we need to rack this. Yes, huh. we're racking. Yeah, we're racking it now. <laughs> Don't mind me. All right, so we racked it. What's racking? It's from moving from one vessel to another. We actually have videos on that if you don't know what that is, but that's the gist. And if you look, minimal headspace. That's actually about perfect, though a little bit more wouldn't really make much difference. Airlock and bung back on it. And what are we gonna do with it now? We're gonna let it sit. Actually, I'm gonna put a label on it. <laughs> And then we're gonna let it sit, probably till it clears. Might be a week, might be two weeks. This one was starting to clear already. So yeah. I think we just disturbed all the leaves and it just, it just needs time to clear out again. So we'll see you when that happens. All right, so when we last left this, it was at 0 0.994 and it was racked. So we're just gonna take the airlock off and we're gonna rack it again. We're just gonna rack it to our pitcher so that way we know exactly what our volume is because of our fancy favorite pitcher. And then we're gonna go straight to bottling. But there's also a very good reason why we're putting it into the pitcher. Because we're going to do a quick preliminary taste. Actually, it's not even a preliminary. This is like our finalization tasting, just to make sure that this is the way we want it to be. Because what it is now is what it's going to be, of course, aside from aging. I think we can take the cap off this time. The cap is important. It is not just for protection anymore, okay? The idea is this can go all the way to the bottom of the fermenter without the cap. So if there's any lees in the bottom, it's gonna get sucked up. There's a very, very fine amount. So I, I'm i taking a little bit of a risk here. You know what? I thought he, better of it. He changed his mind. Yeah, I'm allowed. But there's just a tiny amount there and I really don't want that in our bottles. So yeah, probably better off with the cap. It's been racked. We have 130 ounces, which is, 3,850 milliliters. So it's a little bit more than a full gallon and that's okay because we're gonna take this quick preliminary taste. I will say this, it's kinda nice and clear. It actually cleared up quite nicely. Yeah. 
Now this is very dry, 0.994. Now that's dry according to the numbers. Does that mean the taste is gonna be like that? I would like some sweetness on this. It's a little astringent, and that's the pineapple. I think it needs some. Not a lot. Yeah, it's reminding me of what our original pineapple tasted originally. Because mm -hmm, that one went dry too. Go figure. Yeah, I think it needs a little bit of sweetness. So we'll get ready and um, add some honey. So we're in a bit of a quandary here. We know we want to back sweeten it because we want more of the sweetness to come through. We don't know how to convey this information properly to you because based on what your beverage's final gravity is will be dependent on how much more honey you may or may not want to add. Also, your personal taste of what is sweet and what isn't sweet is going to change that amount as well. We get asked all the time, how much should I back sweeten? Well, that depends on so many factors like Derek just said. So what we're gonna do is we have here some of Bevy's honey that is just a little bit left in the jar and I'm gonna put some in. Now we have it on a scale, so I know how much is going in there, okay? But that's not really the important thing. The important thing is gonna be the specific gravity reading that I'll take at the end. But the way we do it is we just add some, just gonna do like a quarter pound, which is four ounces. There we go, four ounces. Okay, so I added four ounces of honey, so now I'm gonna take that off the scale and give it a mix. This is where you wanna be a little bit careful because this is where you can oxygenate, okay? So you wanna be careful. I'm not stirring it so wildly that it splashes everywhere and that sort of thing. I'm just mixing it, okay? Now, one caveat to doing this is this ended at 15.4% and it used Premier Classique yeast, which is a 13% yeast. You might be tempted to say, oh, it's fine. You're past the yeast tolerance. It won't re-ferment. But well, are you? We don't know that because this was at 0.994. So it's possible it could re-ferment. So we are going to pasteurize this just to play it safe. Okay, that is properly mixed. So I'm just going to pour a little bit into the glass here. I don't think it did a whole lot. I think it needs more. Go with another quarter pound. So it's a double quarter pounder. So yeah, another quarter pound. So we'll be putting in eight ounces or a half pound or 227 grams in total. While I'm doing this, I know someone will ask, how do I know how much to put in? Some of that comes from experience, personal taste, and just having done this hundreds of times to know how much to do. It's somewhat guesswork, but it's kind of an educated guess. Um, Cause I thought maybe a quarter pound would be enough to bring that up, you know, to a little bit over 1.000. So it would have just a touch of sweetness. It didn't really do much at all. So adding half a pound should add about 17 points in total, bring this to like a 1.010 or so gravity, which is on the lightly sweet side, should be um, a nice level of sweetness, should be detectable is the idea. We don't wanna make this uber sweet. If you wanted to, you could certainly add more. Of course, now I'm at the end of the jar, so I only have- <laughs> We're at 3.9. Yeah, I have a 10th of an ounce to go and it's taking forever. <laughs> <Yay>. There we go. <laughs> I was about to have to change cards in the camera for filming here. This is also a nice way to see just how accurate your honey is for points because it should be like 17 and a half points, okay? Which I don't think we can really measure 17 and a half points, but it should bring it to about 1.010, give or take a point or two. Now, some will also argue that because we added volume, we diluted the ABV and they're not wrong, okay? In fact, this is now, it went from that 3850 to about 4,000 milliliters or, you know, something like 132 ounces. Okay, is that some four ounces over 128? Yeah, maybe less than 1% difference. And I don't mean one percentage point of ABV, I mean 1% of the total that it was. So that means out of 15.4%, it might be literally like a couple of percentage points of the percentage of ABV. So it might be like 15.3 instead of 15.4 is basically what I'm getting at. It's not anything really to worry about. If you have a friend, that when you hand it to them says, oh, this should have been 15.4 and it's 15.3 and they turn their nose up, get better friends. Those of you that had that happen know what I'm talking about. I'm guessing though, this is gonna be about as sweet as I really want it to get. Oh, I think that's good. Mm -hmm. It's not overly sweet, but now 
I get a little bit more of the honey and the pineapple is nicely balanced. We'll talk about that more when we do the official tasting, but for now, let's get this in a bottle. All right, so the reading is, if I had to really get specific, 1.011. So it's one point different than what it should have been, which 17 and a half would be 1.0105. So yeah, it's, it's there. 1.011. That's what we're calling it as. This is ready to be bottled, but that 1.011 is just to give you a reference for the sweetness level that we ended up at. Your taste may like it sweeter or drier, but this gives you an idea and it shows you how the math works. You know, adding that half pound actually raised it the amount that it was supposed to. What do you know? So this is gonna go back into here very carefully. All right, so it's time to bottle. And I don't know if you can hear it at all, but it is really, really raining hard outside. Just in the last five minutes, this started up, so I apologize if you hear any off in the background. But the way we bottle is we use an auto siphon and we use a bottling wand. What's a bottling wand? It's just a rod with a springy thing in the end, also called various types of valves. Some people call it a shorter valve, some people call it a stem valve. I'm calling it a springy thing. And what it does is when you push down, it allows the liquid to flow. When you lift up, it stops it. So that way, when you put this into a bottle, you can fill it or not fill it, depending on what your need is. Like when you're changing bottles, you obviously want it to stop. Otherwise, your meat is on the floor, not in a bottle. And that's never a good thing. So we have removed our cap because we know that we are sediment free because we've already wrecked this. So to the bottom it goes. Derek is holding it in the bottle. You want to make sure you push it down. If you've watched our videos before and you've heard this all before, I apologize, but you know what? There's always somebody that this is their first time. So that's why we say that. All right, so we ended up with three 750s full, one one liter. This is actually a one liter, not a 750. And then eh, a mostly full 750 mil. What are we gonna do with these? I'm gonna drink them all right now. I don't think so. One of them, probably one of these three is gonna go away for a whole year. We might even put it away for two years. So that means one year and two year, maybe. That's something we're starting, potentially. Things that we like, or we might like, or might need improvement, or might just be better in two years, we're gonna start doing that. And since we have another mead that we made with pineapple years ago, that's going on four years now, in two years, that'll be six years old. So a six year versus a two year mead, that just sounds like a video in the making to me. And then of course, this one that is half full, we're gonna drink this one in just the next couple of minutes. Okay, before we get to the tasting, something I want to go over again is if you decide to back sweeten like we did, you want to make sure that it will not continue fermenting. For us, that means pasteurization. There are other methods. If you decide to go that route, make sure to follow the manufacturer's directions very carefully because you can, uh, well, you know, make less than favorable results, okay? Pasteurization seems to work really, really well for us. It doesn't take that long. We use a sous vide, makes it nice and simple. We have a video on that. Link in the description below. I will say this, it's got a nice color. It really does. And I'm happy with the clarity too. When you look up through the glass, through you all the layers. You can see, it's like an there's eight. There's a little bit of a haze. It's but an eight. Looking diagonal down through, it looks it actually doesn't, yeah, it looks crystal quite clear. clear. <laughs> quite clear. This sat for a few weeks. Um, this was actually started Oh, this is um, this is like six weeks old at this point. So it's it's pretty young still yeah. by most any standard. It is 15.4%, so that's you know kind of on the upper end of what we like for mead. Technically speaking, it's a sack mead. How crazy is that? Above 15% makes it a sack mead. Curious. I don't know that I'd really like to call this a sack mead. This is this is still a normal. So besides the clarity, the color is really quite pretty. It's a, it's a darker golden amber, rod. Golden rod. I like that word. That's, that's what it that's, is. That's, golden that's rod. That's going to be our descriptor for this mead. Yeah. On the aroma, I am getting the cooked pineapple. Cooked pineapple, a little bit of wood. Yeah. And I, I detect just a touch of a floral, like from the honey. Yeah. Oh yeah. The smell is actually quite nice. Yeah. Okay, I have to admit. Along the way, I smelled like the bitterness of pineapple. Like, you know how pineapple can sometimes be astringent? Sure. That's yeah. what I was getting and I wasn't really thrilled. But I didn't want to say anything because, you know, it was preliminary tastings and stuff. This is the real thing now, so if I feel it now, I'm saying it. I like the smell. But I'm getting a lot of pineapple. It really has pineapple upside down cake. Yes, on it. that. Yep. All right. That's nice. 
It's not overly sweet, but it has a sweetness. Yes. I am trying to mentally compare it to four years ago now, I'm thinking, when we first made oh, the yeah. pineapple mead. And I remember when we first made it, we were like, oh, what do we do? What? what? Well, you it know. Was, it wasn't very pleasant. Well, let, let's, let's do this, though. Uh-oh. Here we go. The old dusty bottle. <laughs> Four years plus. Gonna pour a little bit of this one. Uh, I'll tell you what, that's got some nice color too. Look at that difference in color. That is really quite interesting because we know we oaked this one. Yeah, this one, this one is the newer one. This is our newest pineapple mead that we made with actual pineapple. This one was made with pineapple juice. Now that could be why. Yeah. The pineapple juice could have been pasteurized at the factory where it was packaged, which would cook it, which would darken the color. That's, that's true. That's a, that's a good that's assessment. My, that's my story. I'm I, sticking to it. I, okay. I am going to refill my glass ever so slightly though. Now. So before we get into the comparison, let's let's stick with what we, we have going on here. Oh, okay. Um. Besides my memories of how different the original version was, this one up front, I'm getting the sweetness very first, and then it and then it transitions rather quickly into the almost citrusy aspect of pineapple. Yeah, a little bit. Yep. And that was the astringency I was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And With a little bit of sweetness, it makes it better. Though. And then at the end, I'm getting some of the bitterness of Fermented honey, which is a common thing that we we get. Brian tends to get it more than I do, but I think the pineapple is bringing that out more, and I'm attributing that mostly to its youth at this point. Hmm. Let me take you on a little trip. So as it enters, I immediately get a faint sweet flower, um, and then the citrusy thing comes through. Then as it starts to travel, pineapple is recognizable. It wasn't recognizable as pineapple before, but now it's definitely pineapple and a touch of honey. Like if you just took a couple drops of honey and put it on a piece of pineapple, that's kind of what it comes through as. But it's a cooked pineapple, kind of like the pineapple you pull off the ham. It's not fresh, in other words. It's, it's not coming across sure. as fresh. And then on the finish, like she said, it has a slight astringency. I do get that honey bitterness in the back of my throat. Not unpleasant, just yeah. that is a thing that happens with mead, with me. Derica gets it too. Um, the finish is actually quite long. It stays with you. Like, as I'm breathing, I'm tasting it, like feeling it as I'm breathing out. It sounds really weird, but you know what I mean, if you know what I mean. I attribute that actually to the higher ABV on it, this. It very well could be. I don't taste alcohol though. No, it's more of the the, the pineapple astringency that I, I'm... But what I mean is, this is 15 is, plus yeah. percent, I don't really taste alcohol. Yeah. It doesn't taste like ethanol. Like sometimes no, no, they no, can no. be very harsh. Yeah. I think this is gonna age beautifully. Yes. A year or two, and this is going to be super smooth and wonderful. And that's when we segue into the original pineapple mead because we did notice that as it aged, it just got better and better. There is no comparison on the smell. This is nothing like it at all. Oh, wow. It is cooked, cooked, cooked. It's almost a boche cooked. That's nuts. It is completely different. Okay, so But that... wait a minute, before we go into this too much, let's just give this a score. Okay, all right. Because that could, that could skew the score. And remember, our scoring system goes one through 10. One being absolute crap. We probably wouldn't serve it to our worst enemy, and we might even dump it down the drain. 10 means, this is awesome. This is like the best thing I've made. This is the best thing I have in my collection. However you want to see it. Keep in mind, we have gone to 11. Ours does go to 11. And we've only done that, we've gone over 10 twice, I think. Two different, two different brewers have gone over 10. But 10 is pretty much the high water mark, if you will. The other ones were kind of just memes. It's kind of like the Drew Carey show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? We make up the points and they just don't matter. Um, I have a number. I kind of do. All right, one, two, three, six point five. Wow. I expected her to like this more than me. <laughs> so I knew I was comfortable at seven because I'm enjoying this, but let's hear from Brian. 
to oh, see why he went lower. I don't hate it, but here's the thing. Pineapple for me, as much as I like pineapple, has to be very sweet. And that's my issue. I don't wanna make this overly sweet because then it just gets sickly sweet. But by not making it more sweet, the pineapple comes across as a little bit astringent. I hate to use this word, but I get a grapefruit type thing from it. And I just hate grapefruit. I just cannot stand it. The flavor, the taste, everything about it bothers me, which is weird because I like oranges. I even like lemons a little. And I like our rank per lime. But grapefruit, oh my God, why would anyone want to eat that on purpose? Just <laughs> doesn't make sense to me. So whenever I detect that, it turns me off. That said, I can get past it because there's just enough sweetness to get there, just enough pineapple flavor to offset it a little bit, but it is kind of there. So it, I'm hoping that ages out. I feel like oaking this up front did this a world Smoothed of it good. so much. Because even though we're gonna get to the comparison of, of that in a second, even though there's differences here and they're now coming more forward as we're experimenting with these things, I still think putting Oh yeah, uh, I agree. the wood in in primary, which is something I would have never thought to have done before, actually helped us a lot. Yeah, it gave a lot more mouthfeel. This has a very rich, thick, viscous mouthfeel that would not have happened had we not oaked it. Now we could oak it at this point forward, and it would probably come out much the same. Okay, but this is it was easier, honestly. So let's let's get to it. I am going to give my impression here. Light, floral, almost a white wine mixed with pineapple on the new one. Deep, rich, heady, bochet, caramel. Not even the same ballpark. Like if this, if we said that this is pineapple upside down cake, I don't know what that is then because that is pineapple upside down cake. That is the glaze on the bottom, like the charred part. Yeah, yeah. This would be like the top part that just barely got any cooking done to it. They're so, you would never think they were both pineapple. This is more floral and fresh where this is more cooked, almost burnt. Yeah. And it's really interesting to good, me though. because I never would have thought that there would have been such a difference. And many viewers have asked us, you should do a comparison between brewing with juice versus brewing with fruit and using the same fruit, like fruit juice and fruit solids. And I'm like, yeah, it's just going to be the same thing, right? Mm. This is telling me no, not at all. I'm going to reserve my opinion until she takes a taste. Can I say it now? Can I say it? Can I say it? Can I say it? The new one is so much better. Oh my God, it is so much better. The older one is watery and thin. It has a little bit of almost a burnt flavor. It doesn't have the tannic aspect that you want. It doesn't have a good mouth feel. I remember liking this one better, but I've been drinking so much of this. Yeah. I don't even have to take a sip of this Now what's that. scary is like... this has been improving for four years. Yeah. So imagine how crappy this was when we first made it. This is the difference that several years of experience can make. When I first made this, I really didn't know much about making mead. Wow. And well, yeah, now we can sculpt a brew much better than we could back then. I, I, would, I would go out on a limb and say, if you intend on fermenting something with pineapple, just use fresh pineapple, don't use pineapple juice. I say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to that, no, no. I had to. It's a thing. It changed the color. But I'm wondering if it's if it's not only just Oh, see now that's actually kind of nice. using the pineapple juice but oaking it up front. It might have been the combination of having mm. fresh pineapple oaked up front. This is so much brighter in flavor yeah. and stronger in flavor. All the uh, favorable flavors. Whereas the other one has a lot of darker uh, more sullen notes. It's the easiest way to describe it. Mixing them improved it, but you know, because you put a good one with a not so good one, it's gonna get better, right? It's got like a sour note to it that I'm not, not getting. Not vinegary though. No, 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 no not, not, vi vinegary. not vinegary. There is definitely a little bit of a sourness and I think it's more dry too. Mm -hmm. This, I know the old one was very dry. It came out totally dry. Yeah. This one we sweetened. Had we not sweetened it, they might be more similar, but the this taste, is true. the this taste is true. though, the flavor profiles are so completely different. 
I'm shocking. I'm really enjoying the floral note in here. Mm -hmm. I want to think that there is a slight hint of vanilla, which would See, now I have which would be taste. appropriate since we oaked it. Those tend mm. to give a mm -hmm. slight vanilla. Vanilla. Yep. Yep. And I think I think that's helping it. As it's well, because it. it's smoothing out the. Yeah, vanilla has a tendency to make things just go smoother. Yeah. It rounds off those sharp corners, which pineapple has some rough corners. That's the thing. It's a little more acidic. It's got a lot going going on. So yes. yeah, it needs that. Yes. And I think that worked out well. Uh, I have to be honest with you. I'm completely shocked at the difference between the two oh, yeah. beverages. I thought they were going to taste a lot more similar. I do not want to drink the old pineapple mead anymore. Yeah. Compared to this, no, I don't just, I don't want to drink it. Maybe there won't be a six year tasting of that one. Maybe we'll just continue with this one. Let this one become the new, the new pineapple mead every year. Yeah, I don't, I, I think that's that's it for that, right? We no, don't have I any other bottles? We have whole bottle. Oh, we do? Mm -hmm. Then if that's the case, Maybe we I, need to cook with it. I wouldn't be opposed to oaking it. Oh, oak it now, okay. Yeah. All right, um, maybe we'll do a video on that even. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to pour it out of the bottles and do it safely so that we don't oxidize, but uh, yeah. I'm sure we could figure out a way to do that. It's probably better than leaving it sitting around for 10 more years and not wanting to drink it. So, you know, we'll go with that. Yes, Even though yes. I only gave it a 6.5, I think it's going to improve so much in a year that it'll, it'll be much, much higher next year when you guys see it again. But uh, as always, guys, thanks so much for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.